bleeding in the procedure really can affect your ability to perform this procedure. So basically, I break this surgery down into three steps. First step is the incision and dissection down to the levator. So you're making the skin incision and then you're removing tissue to get down to the level of the levator. The next step is placing those anchoring sutures, which will connect the skin to the levator aponeurosis. And then the last step is to check the symmetry by having the patient open their eyes, make adjustments as necessary, and then closure of the skin. So when we do the incision and the dissection, hemostasis is critical, so you have to minimize the amount of bleeding. Once you start getting a lot of bleeding and things swell up, that's when you can start having uh, issues with trying to be able to judge the symmetry because it, it, you have, might have done the procedure fine, but because of the swelling, the creases are going to look off. And uh, if that happens, it's, it's just very difficult to know sometimes what is the end result going to be like. I use a Colorado, Colorado tip uh, cautery on low coagulation. All right, so this is a animation. Let's see if this will go. Okay. Okay, so that's basically making the skin incision. And the next is going to be removal of the of the strip of skin. So removal of the, the strip of skin, you can see I haven't really removed any of the muscle underneath and I've done that on purpose just so that it doesn't bleed as much. It takes a little bit more time, but it's, it's worthwhile. So after the skin is removed, then we will get the little bleeders. So that's the Colorado tip the cautery buzzing the vessel so it stops bleeding. And then the next thing we'll do is we're going to start to remove the tissue. So when we remove the tissue, we're doing it right along where the incision has been made. And the goal is get down from the level of the skin down to the levator. So you can see that we've removed the strip of the orbicularis there. And as we continue to go deeper, So you can see that as you go deeper, you start seeing some fat and that fat is either the fat that's just underneath the orbicularis muscle, or it's possible that we have broken through the um, septum already and are at the level of the pre fat or preceptal fat, I mean, and, and that's, it's important to be very incremental in your excision because you can go through the levator. It's possible to go through the levator if you're not careful. All right, so once you think you're near the, the right level, then the way I, the thing that I like to do is do something called what I call the, I've coined it the pull test, which is distracting the lid by pulling on the base of the wound to see if the lid comes with it. So you can see what, 
when I was doing that distraction test, the lid came up directly with it. If you're not deep enough, what's going to happen is you'll pull on the wound and the lid won't really move. So you're looking for a one-to-one -one correspondence with, uh, with the movement of your forcep and the lid itself. Once you see that, then you can be pretty confident that you're at the right level. It's interesting to note that it doesn't have to be right at the level of the levator to, to be able to do that. Meaning that the section, you don't have to necessarily get to the levator. Once you see the, the pull test work like that, you can be pretty confident that you can start putting your stitches in. And you can also see that when I was doing that section, I would bias the, the removal right at the edge of where my incision is. So the, it's very important to try to do your removal and place your stitches right at that level so that you can have your uh, crease set at the correct level. Mm -hmm. You don't Sometimes. actually have to see levator fibers or anything like that. You're just pulling and you know that you're in that correct plane then. That's right. Okay. And, and I find that it's notoriously difficult sometimes to actually see what is the levator at that point in Asian lids. In Caucasian patients, it's actually very easy. But in that area, there's so much, what I find there's so much variation is that you can get yourself into trouble by going through the levator. Now, if you go through the levator at certain points, there's so much width of attachment that it's not really a big deal. If you go through in, in, uh, certain points, you're not going to get a ptosis. But if you are very aggressive and you release it all the way across, then uh, you could run into some problems. In that dissection, you'll, I didn't show it on the videos, but there, there is some fat that's removed as well. And sometimes there's so much fat in the lids that we have to remove more fat than just at the level of the crease. So I'm talking about above the crease. This video sh shows dissection of the fat pocket. It doesn't show the removal, but it, you know, the, the removal could have been, or was done in this case, but it's just not shown. So right, let's go back there. Okay, so there's that fat pad, see it's lifted, and there you can see the levator apneurosis, that white mm -hmm. structure right there. Yep. And so, if I want to move the fat, I would just open up the septum here and remove the fat. If you're going to approach this fat pad, we always approach it laterally because it's much easier to find. Sometimes when you get lost and you don't know where you are, finding this pat, fat and elevating it, flipping it up, will help you identify it where the levator is if you can't just remove it directly from that area or you're unsure as to where you are. So the next step is anchoring. So I use 609 and what I'm doing is grabbing a bite of the levator or peritarsal tissues. So where we make the incision is usually still along the, the width of the tarsus. It's usually not above. Grab a little bit of that tissue and then catch the dermal edge of the lower incision flap. And as I said before, it's very important to get the correct height so that it is in line with your pre-marked incision. And it's important to do this the same on both sides and to be consistent so you don't have one stitch higher and lower and higher and lower. You just want to have a smooth arc when you place these incisions. And it's also important to alternate between the eyes, I find. So that means you do one stitch on one side, then you go to the other instead of finishing one and then going to do the other in its entirety. I find that if you want to maintain symmetry, you'll be much more consistent if you place, like say the central stitch on one side, then you do the same thing on the other side. Then you maybe do the medial stitch on one side and you do the same thing on the other side. That will help that makes sense. keep the, keep the yeah. symmetry point good. Do you do your regular upper lid blefts like that where you're doing them simultaneously? No. Maybe just before before closure. But before no, closure, just, yeah. Yeah, just to check. Yeah. So this is a schematic of the anchoring. So you can see, here's the incision. We grab a bite of the vader aponeurosis, and then we grab a bite of the inferior skin flap, and we sort of, sort of sew that down. Do you ever run into wound healing issues with a permanent stitch in an area where the skin is so thin? 
no permanent issues. Sometimes because it's so superficial, you'll have the the end of the stitch poke through a little bit. So it'll come through the mm -hmm. incision. And if that happens, we can try to clip it so that it'll sink down and get buried again. Or sometimes we have to end up removing it. it if that happens, sometimes the patient gets like a little suture abscess and give them a little bit of antibiotic and it, okay. and it goes away. We try to leave those anchoring stitches in for at least 10 weeks if possible so that there can be some scar formation before we take it out. Okay. So okay. sometimes the stitch does become exposed, but it's, it usually doesn't cause really any major issues at all. It's a more of a minor thing. So that's one stitch placed. So on the other side, we're doing it at the same location. So see, we're grabbing the base and you can see there's that one-to-one -one correspondence and we're putting the stitch through that and then grabbing the underside of the dermis and uh, using Castroveo needle drivers is important for precision. And then we just tie it down. And so when you're doing this, you're also looking at the other side to make sure that it's a uh, similar height as on the other side. Do you ever worry about catching the tarsal plate or that's not even close to where you are depth wise? So you can actually catch the tarsal plate. That is actually one of the methods that is described. The, the main downside of that is that when you catch the tarsal plate, then you end up with a crease that's more static as opposed to dynamic. Mm -hmm. And what that means is when the eyes are closed, you should not see a crease. You should not see this indentation or a line there. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you catch a tarsal plate, then it becomes more static. The, that crease becomes more stuck. And then you see a line that's, that's always there. So you can do it that way, but aesthetically, it's just better to, um, to catch the nervator or the peritarsal tissues only. But in general, the, the tarsal plate is so tough. It, yeah. It's not easy to sink a, a stitch through that anyways. Yeah. So it's usually not an issue. Right. Makes sense. All right. So then going back to the other side. We'll do the next medial anchoring suture. And then we, we tie that down. So then it goes back and forth until both sides are done. As I said before, it's usually four to five anchoring points per side. And then if you've made an incision that's a little bit off, on one side or the other, you can correct for that. When we place the stitches, you can put a little bit more stretch on the flap to account for that. So there are some things you can do if, if the incision isn't exactly perfect when you've, when you've made it. All right, so we've seen that one already. Okay, so the last step is to check for symmetry and then you close. So I don't have a video of this, but I ask patients to open their eyes this is before closure. And then I look to see what the creases look like. I used to sit them up and do this whole thing that made it very complicated. Now I just ask them to open their eyes. And from experience, I'll just know if it's going to be um, uh, symmetric enough. If it's not, let's say one crease doesn't look high enough, then I maybe take a stitch or two out and readjust so that it does look symmetric. At this point, I might also remove a little bit of extra skin from the upper flap as well to make everything as symmetric as possible. So once everything looks good, then we do the closure of the skin and just, just a short bit of that. So I use a running set of oh. I was How often do you find that you actually have to do what you're describing and actually make those alterations? Is that a common occurrence? No, I would say maybe 10% of the cases. Usually, okay. if, if you get enough experience, you'll know if it looks good when you're doing it. You'll have a very good sense for it. It looks very symmetric and feel that everything is working nicely. So anyways, then we use a subcuticular closure, same 6 nylon. So with this operation, you can actually do the entire uh, surgery, usually with one 6 nylon uh, suture if you want. Oh, wow. <laughs> very economical. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. 
All right. So let's take a look at some results. This is a before and after, and you can see the patient did not have much of a supertussal increase afterwards, and it's uh, higher afterwards. This is a, more of a close up um, of that same patient. Oh, wow. And did you and did she select that parallel fold? Like you, you sit down with them and and. So that's amazing. That's amazing. It looks just like you're drawing. Thank you. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So when we do, you saw how I, I did the simulation with the instrument. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Usually that will let you know, let the surgeon know how the crease is going to behave as it goes medially. So what that means is it'll either look parallel or look tapered. And then depending on what the patient wants, then you can advise them further, you can say, okay, this is, it's probably going to look parallel. Is this okay? If they're not okay with that, you can actually design the operation by making the incision taper in a little bit more to create mm -hmm. that tapered incision. On the flip side though. Yeah, go ahead, Sam. No, go ahead. I was just, no, go ahead. And then I was going to comment on this particular patient okay. on the flip side. On the flip side, if you do that and the patient has a tapered crease, but they want a parallel crease, then we have to go into some discussions about whether or not they want to do an epicanthoplasty. And the reason is most of the time, if a patient has a tapered crease that occurs when you're simulating, it's because they have an epicanthal fold that forces the crease to, to fold in a certain way as it gets towards the, the nose. And if you don't relieve those tight forces that are there by doing an epicanthoplasty, you're generally not going to be able to get a parallel crease or it's not as likely. So then I tell them, okay, if you want a parallel crease, I would recommend to do the epicanthoplasty. But if, if you don't want to do the epicanthoplasty, I can try to get a parallel crease by altering how the incisions are made, basically make them higher and bring them beyond the epicanthal fold. But there's no guarantee of that. So they just have to be aware of what the potential outcomes are when we do that. How many patients are really aware about the change in epicanthal fold in terms of their appearance? Because I feel like that's, it's a dramatic change, but I think it's something that not that many patients would actually be aware of even knowing to bring up. That's right. In general, it depends on your patient, patient population. Generally, I, like I find like really young patients know about this, but okay. if they don't, you can just do the simulation and say, okay, this is what it's going to look like. And that's, they're assuming they're just going to come in to do double fold. They're not thinking about epicanthoplasty or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And so if you show them that and they're happy with it, then you don't have to you know, go, go further with the mm -hmm. discussion. If it's a patient who you think might want to do that, or you think it would look much better with it, then you can um, simulate an epicanthoplasty with them. And what you do is after you put the paper clip in with your other finger, you sort of draw, you, you sort of pull, pull the medial lid skin medially towards the nose. And instantly you'll be able to see what the, what the parallel look would be. So that's very handy for them to see. And maybe from that, they can decide whether or not they want to do an epicanthoplasty or they want a parallel crease. What, you can what also percentage? do a oh, percentage. So percentage of patients who do epicanthoplasty, I would say like 10 to 20%. Okay. And you can also do an epicanthoplasty without a parallel crease. Why would somebody do that? Mostly because they don't necessarily want a parallel crease, but the epicanthal fold is so significant. It makes the eyes look rounded. Sometimes Asian patients look sort of cross-eyed. I don't know if you've ever seen that before. Mm -hmm. Because of that, that skin sort of making the horizontal width of the lids much shorter. In this particular case, this patient, it, it was more of a challenge because she has 
uh, asymmetric, uh, asymmetry, which you can actually see here. And so was that more of a challenge in terms of address? How common is that where you see some sort of asymmetry? So it's very common. Maybe you don't always see like one side has no fold and one side has some fold, but it's very common for there to be a very tiny fold that you can just barely see and then nothing on the other side. This one is a little bit more noticeable. So it's challenging in that sometimes you have to tell the patient that it's in their best interest to do both sides, even if they don't want to change the crease that they feel, the side that they feel is normal. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is because when we create these creases, the, uh, the definition is very, it, it's a very defined looking appearance. Whereas natural creases, as you guys have probably seen, can sometimes be very faint. They're not very mm -hmm. noticeable. And if you have that situation and you just do one side and the other side is faint, you're going to have asymmetry. Not maybe because of the height, but just the, the other characteristics, the depth of the fold might be a little bit different. So usually w when we have something like this, we also ask them, do you want to change your quote unquote good side? We can make it a little bit higher if you want to get more pretarsal show. And if that's, if, if, if that crease looks very faint, then I'll make a general recommendation. Yeah, you should do it like this or else you could end up with some asymmetry afterwards. And you should, the patients will be fine with that once they understand the reasoning behind it. Mm -hmm. All right. So next, so again, another patient with asymmetry. Okay. And you can see that without the crease, it even looks like the eye aperture is actually smaller on her right side. And that's, I think partly because of the illusion that the crease gives to make the eye look bigger. Partly it may be because she has skin that hangs over the lid margin without actual ptosis. As I said before, we call that pseudotosis orientalis. And so this is afterwards, okay? And you can see that it looks like the aperture looks bigger afterwards. I don't remember in this patient if I did one or both sides. I think I might have done both sides on her. Just another example, no uh, supertarsal crease, pre-op, and then supertarsal crease afterwards. Another example, see this one has a very sort of faint supertarsal crease on her left, and then afterwards. Nice creases. This patient had Asian blepharoplasty plus lower lip blepharoplasty done at the same time. And so this is a little bit closer up of the appearance afterwards. Uh, another patient sees very low lying creases and then afterwards, um, bit of elevation there. What's the distribution Some, of age in your uh, patients? So usually most patients who do this, I would say are younger. So it starts at 18 years old and, and the average goes up to maybe thirties. And then after thirties, it starts to diminish a bit. Yeah. Cause you can see most of these patients are pretty young. Mm-hmm. Uh, this patient, you see how her creases aren't very well defined. And so that is, um, that is another indication. So her creases are much more defined afterwards. Plus her creases are actually higher, but because she's wearing a little bit of makeup, it's, uh, it's not as easy to see. That's another thing that we discuss. If a patient plans to wear a lot of eye makeup or wears eyeliner specifically, that usually makes the pretarsal show a little bit smaller. So they have to decide when they're figuring out what height they want as to if they usually wear makeup or, or not wearing makeup, because that will impact on the appearance. Just another patient sort of faint folds in the extra skin. 
Uh, another asymmetry. What is the gender breakdown? It's about 90% female, 10% male, mm -hmm. uh, which is similar to usual cosmetic surgery. It's another mm -hmm. male patient. More of a conservative crease, but better symmetry afterwards. And then now we get back to that first patient that I showed you. So this is her from the front view and uh, just a lateral view. And I think that's it. Yeah. All right. So hopefully you gain some perspective. I, I left out a lot about the, you know, the post-op and, mm -hmm. and the planning and, and uh, all the things about epicantoplasty and uh, mm -hmm. ptosis correction, but it's a, it's a lot of material that could be uh, covered, but I think this is a generally fairly decent overview of what the surgery does. That is, uh, those are phenomenal results, Larry. Just the, the precision that you show um, and the level of detail, I think, is very, is very just eye-opening. I think most plastic surgeons don't do this operation. Mm -hmm. Myself, I've never done an Asian blepharoplasty. And after watching this, I'm just going to send them to you. Um, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> because Thank you. Because, because you, you do an amazing job and you clearly do a lot of this. And um, I just, I'm blown away by your results. Yeah. It's really amazing. When I first started in practice, in private practice, I did some, and like you said, this was something, and only because I'm Asian and uh, there were a couple of drawbacks. One was um, I never learned like you at Michigan to do a formal, mm -hmm. I never formally learned how to do an Asian bluff. There is a plethora of techniques, as you mentioned out there. So it's really hard to settle on something. If you're just trying to learn, this was probably like 10, 15 years ago. And then the, the third thing is my patients assume, many of them patients, assumed I spoke, assumed I spoke either Mandarin or Korean, Korean or, Korean or Korean something, and I, I don't speak anything. I, like, don't speak anything. in so, this area, especially, there are a lot of immigrants, there are a lot of people coming uh, from overseas, and, and so at that point, it was um, a moot point. Because it's, you are familiar with the landmarks if you've done upper lid blefts, which all of us do regularly, but the, as Sam said, that the precision and dialing in the consistency is what's key for doing this well. And the fact that there are conditions here, you can actually see whether it's actual or not, whether the aperture looks different size wise, like the eye, it, there are a lot of things which dramatically affect eye appearance. And it, and as you said, it's not just a straight westernization of an Asian upper lid. There are specific aesthetic values that are being addressed here, which are specific to the Asian eyelid. And it's not just doing something that makes an Asian lid look more Western. And that the fact that you also incorporate the patient's preferences significantly, you, you say that at every step of your procedure or your process is you're taking in the patient's preferences. You're asking them about their makeup, their, their lifestyle, their overall aesthetic values. That's crazy important because of the people that I'm not, I don't, I'm not going to denigrate anyone, but there are a lot of people who are very cookie cutter, do it the same way all the time. And we know people like that for any procedure, probably. And I think the key here is how you customize it. So there's no doubt that if there's anyone that I know who is looking for this type of procedure, I'm going to just have them drive up to Toronto or fly up to Toronto and, and, and see you about it. Cause it's, that's truly amazing. That's a uh, very kind of you to say it, it is true. If you just watch the videos, you can really understand the procedure. It's not that difficult of a concept, but it's just, uh, like you said, execution is very important, uh, for success and, uh, getting consistency. And, you know, the only way that you can get that is, you know, by doing cases. So that's the sort of conundrum, right? If, if you don't do a lot of cases, then you never get as comfortable, uh, with it. And so just 
there's a starting point that everybody has to go through. But I think that any of our co-residents would be able to perform this operation very well if you just take a little bit of time to understand what the surgery is about and just take it slow and, and be careful when you're doing this when you're doing this surgery. This surgery does have a revision rate that's a little bit higher than what you would see in uh, you know regular blepharoplasty. I would put that maybe about five to seven percent. And that's meaning patients who eventually come back to do a little bit of a touch up. So whether it's like you know removal the most common would be like removal of a little bit more skin just to get the symmetry to be perfect. Um, because mm -hmm. it's sometimes it's just hard. But it's very important for patients to be understanding that it takes time. Right after the surgery, as you probably know, the crease looks super high. And if you don't tell them that beforehand, they're gonna freak out <laughs> when you take out take out your tape and take out your stitches. <laughs> so it's very important to educate them beforehand that it's gonna look high and maybe even look uneven. Swelling can occur differentially. And when I do the surgery, I put a, a very thin stereo strip on the incision. And so wherever you put that stereo strip is going to affect the swelling. And you, you might know that patients use eyelid tape to create creases non-surgically. And that's like having eyelid tape there for a week before it, before it comes off. So you're going to get this, what I call a false crease for at least a few days before it returns to normal. So it's very important to tell patients it's going to look high, might look uneven, but don't worry about it because if it looked even during the procedure, when I checked you, checked the symmetry, then uh, it should work out in the end. It might take a few weeks. Sometimes it takes a few months, but just for them to be patient. Wow. That was amazing. Larry, I really appreciate you spending the time and uh, I, again, would encourage anyone who is interested to go to Dr. Tong's website. It's myplasticsurgerytoronto.com. Again, thank you to uh, Dr. Sam Jajurkar in Dallas, Texas, our recovering uh, colleague, Dr. Sal Pacella out in La Jolla, who is recovering uh, from his knee surgery. And I am Dr. Sam Rhee at Bergen, uh, Bergen Cosmetic in uh, New Jersey. And we will see you all very soon. Thanks again, Larry, and have a great day. Thank you very much. And Sal, Sal, I'm sorry you couldn't be here. I have a message for you, Sal. You got to come in. <laughs> 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 Thanks, Larry. All right. <laughs> All right. Take care. That's an inside joke, folks. All right. See you later. Bye. Bye. <laughs>